This is a story of how a girl from Ohio and her friends took over New York City and changed the world. All right, baby, listen here now for the last time. You don't care for me. I don't care about that. A long time ago in the 60s, a young white girl committed herself to being a revolutionary. She became many things revolutionary, a performance artist, an anti-war activist, a Black Panther sympathizer. She was an unlikely revolutionary, a white girl from Ohio with Southern girl charm. Eventually, she made her revolution a personal one and she took her personal revolution show all over the world. She lived and loved in all the romantic cities, you know what I'm saying? I moved to the East Village of Manhattan in the late 1970s when CBGB's was the local bar and Blondie and Talking Heads were the house bands. Then the underground film scene took off. In the next couple of years, I would star in 14 beyond low budget features. I think that you are the most beautiful woman that I have ever seen. You know, to someone collecting her rent, she may have just been another underground filmmaker. But to the downtown NY hipster world, she was a superstar. But her true destiny was still to come. It all began when Patty met Fab Five Freddy. I heard that she's gonna make a story on graffiti and the rap scene. Hey man, it's about time we get some publicity for this goddamn rap shit. You know, people rapping, man. Us out there doing art on the subways and making things look all beautiful. I met Fat Five Freddy, and little did I know my life would take a totally new direction. Watch out for the third rail, baby. He introduced me to a whole world of hip hop, which was graffiti art, rap music, and breakdancing. Rap music. Yeah, like, you know, the MCs, they get up on the mic, and they, like, shout everybody, you know, everybody say ho. Bricks in a bus, brakes on the car, brakes to make you a superstar. Brakes to win. The queen of downtown had met the king of uptown, and the art world was never going to be the same. I have read somewhere that a culture that to be complete has to have music, a visual art, and dance. I had thought like, well, this graffiti thing was over here going on by itself, and then this hip hop thing was going on over here by itself. And the break dancing was a thing that would happen, but it was just all apart, but at the same time, things were separate. People were doing their own things. And then I had the idea that this was all one thing. Shortly after connecting with Fab, I met Bill Stelling, who told me he had a small studio on East 11th Street to fix up as a gallery, and did I know any artists? I'm looking for Artists. We are all graffiti artists. Gosh, I knew a lot of artists. We ended up opening the gallery with a show by my ex-husband, Stephen Kramer, and all of a sudden we had an art gallery. At first glance, it's all, oh, it's just graffiti, you know, and people don't see beyond that. And some people were willing to go the extra effort to make that distinction, like Patty Astor, she was the first gallery ever to give one man, one woman shows to graffiti artists. The fun gallery was response to these big, boring Soho openings with stuff that you really needed to go to art school to pretend to understand. I never understood anything but art. We decided it was time for a breath of fresh air. It's a party! It was, it was a great way to lift people out of their normal existence. And I think that's what lended to the charisma, you know, like the whole aura of it that like, wow, you know, this is such a beautiful thing that comes out of the dark. It was hip hop before it became hip hop. I met Keith Herring when I was on Astor Place, my namesake. He came up to me, introduced himself and said, can I take your picture? Of course, I said. That was a really lucky day for me because Keith became a major fun gallery artist and supporter. Jean-Michel Basquiat was homeless when I met him on the staircase up to the VIP room of the Mud Club. I was just teasing him about his weird hairdo and then found out he was a brilliant artist. His show at the Fun Gallery is generally recognized as his best show ever. You know, something was in the air. 
and the fun gallery was a magnet for people from every walk of life. Rich, poor, famous, unknown, white, brown, black, gay, straight, and everything in between. It was a scene. On any one night, you'd see Andy Warhol, The Clash, Matt Dillon, Johnny Rotten, Leah Castelli, Joy Schnabel. The Beastie Boys hung out as bratty teens, and then John Michel would be over in the corner fighting with his new girlfriend, this young chick who called herself Madonna. Maybe now she's the most powerful woman in the world, but back then she was the club slut. Giving blowjobs to all the guys in the men's bathroom at Danceteria. She's done well for herself, obviously. Because everything was happening so fast at that time. There was so much attention coming up to the whole movement. And like any art movement, we took it on to ourselves and said, you know what, we've discovered this as, an, as truly our, our voice and, and, and an art movement that has some credibility. We invented something without even acknowledging art history because we were making art history. I'm in the art business. I run that little museum down the street. What's, what's the name of it? So Whitley. As a celebrity superstar, you know, it's always better to leave the party before it ends. We survived. The neighborhood mafia coming after us, the garbage cans being thrown through the window, the picking up of the heroin addict out of the doorway, but it began to be the end. After the first two years, with all the success and publicity we received, the art school business graduates started to move in. When the legendary St. Mark's Cinema turned into the gap, I knew it was time to go. Then AIDS and the corporations took over. They didn't see the end coming, both the scene and people's lives. Her integrity was ultimately her own demise, but soon the galleries figured out how to co-op what Patty and her group had. Eventually, what was just a subculture from a small group of creative people in a dumpy gallery in the East Village soon became an aesthetic that would not only change the world, but eventually overtook it. Now that sensibility is used to sell everything from people to automobiles. I knew Keith was ill and sent him a last letter. The news came to me in California, February 16th, 1990, that he was gone. The streets had emptied. The laughter in the clubs stilled. If Fab Five Freddy had been her black Moses, leading us across the wilderness to a new and better land, Keith was our guardian angel, lighting every corner and including every soul in the great adventure we shared. It seemed like all my friends were gone, but we had done it, created something new and meaningful, which no matter how brief its duration, would live on in our paintings, photographs, films, and music. As a young revolutionary, I'd been exhorted to seize the time. For over a decade, we own the time. The last time anything had been done just for fun.